Kim Jong-il has uh, promoted his youngest son, four-star general. There's been some sort of a promotion for his aunt. Uh, what does this all mean, and what do we know about it? The truth is that uh, we know remarkably little about Kim Jong-il's youngest son. We think he is around 27 or 28 years old. Um, uh, pictures that we have of him are uh, uncertain from an earlier period. He, we think we studied abroad uh, uh, for uh, some period of his uh, uh, high school or uh, uh, education. Um, we know almost nothing about him. I think, I, I think our uh, uh, key here is to be uh, careful uh, to make sure that we're in very deep consultations with our friends in the region. I'll be in Japan and South Korea next week. We obviously uh, want to hear uh, their views. Our uh, uh, positions uh, about uh, what's necessary in terms of re-engagement in six-party talks and uh, other kinds of engagement remain consistent and uh, frankly we'll be, uh, uh, we'll be waiting and uh, watching carefully. Let me ask, Ernie, uh, yeah. it's been reported that Chinese officials privately are referring to the South China Sea now as a core interest of China. Uh, number one, is that true? And if so, what does that mean and does that change things? It's interesting because the Chinese are clearly sort of clawing back from that public position. Uh, they, they definitely saw a, a real reputational blow after their, the way they reacted to Secretary Clinton's remarks in Hanoi. Uh, a lot of the Southeast Asians felt like this was the unmasking of a China that had been on a, on a two-decade charm offensive in Southeast Asia, and they'd done a great job with it, believe me. Um, really good job. Well, we, uh, you know, the, the script for the Americans was more that we've been diverted and, and not as focused. So um, I, I think the Southeast Asians felt, well, wait a minute, this is, we've got some atavistic sort of concerns about what this big neighbor uh, to the north is, is thinking about. And, and if after, uh, you know, sort of this economic diplomacy uh, has got us feeling pretty good, if, if the punchline is that we need to heal to Chinese sovereignty, well, then wait a minute. The, we, we're not sure we want that deal. When you, I think about what I've heard um, all three of our panelists uh, say here, I think we've learned something about Chinese behavior in the past few weeks mm. and how they are beginning to act more broadly on the world stage. So what have we seen? In the neighborhood, whether it's the South China Seas or the Senkaku Islands, we're seeing old claims that have been around for a long time that they are suddenly willing to go out and, and make an issue of. North Korea, um, as Kurt has pointed out, this, as uh, Ambassador Roy said, um, is a special case for the Chinese because they feel that this is their client state, they're going through a very difficult uh, period of transition, and they don't want to see a collapse that results in having South Korea and American troops right up on their border. Everybody in Asia has noticed that China has been more assertive in pushing forward its interests vis-a-vis uh, -vis countries around it over the last few years. Uh, and it's a matter of concern to them. But we need to remember that what they say to us and what they say to the Chinese are two different things. And so we need to be careful not interpreting how they're reacting strictly in terms of how we are seeing the situation, but rep re recognize that we need some outside perspectives on it also. But I've talked to a whole range of Asians, and I've gotten a consistent view that they are noticing what we are noticing. In addition to this video highlight, you can watch the entire discussion on CSAS.org or iTunes U.